Там на четвертом музыке. Ну, бог с ним. Это геморрогная штука, вот эти исковые. Даже хуже, чем лента протяги. Боже, переноску я не знаю. Лента протяги это вообще. Особливо вакуум мне. Подивіться, яка краса. Ну, це просто приємно дивитися. Ну, так, але все є, але якби ще воно ти це показало... Welcome back to our laboratory of the endless exploration of Chernobyl technology. Well, our today's episode is going to be rather unusual, because we are going to take a look at two, without overestimation, technical unicorns. And one of them is here. So, those who watched our previous episodes indeed remember this briefcase and probably wondered what's inside. So, that is a cool thing. This device is a portable testing system for a huge 300 kg heavy hard disk drive for Soviet mainframe computers. Those drives are of a type ES5061 and, during the first decade after the disaster, they were widely used at the various facilities of the Chernobyl zone. For example, they are part of the auxiliary information system DE, so the Scala reactor control computer we had recently an amazing documentary about. By the way, we still have some posters with Scala reload available, so check the description below if you want to get one. In the early period, those drives also were the data storages of so-called Shatter and Finnish information systems. Those computer systems aggregated a lot of telemetry data from detectors installed across the sarcophagus of the destroyed reactor 4, and this way they provided crucial information about its internal conditions. We actually had a chance to meet their developers, so about Shatter and Finnish we will talk in our next episodes as well. But for now we already translated some unique reports about those systems into English. You can find that on our Patreon page. And given that year just started, we have a few news for you. Last month we finished the project of the recreation of the very first Chernobyl robot. By the way, check it out. And a good thing is, it will appear in quite near future as an interactive exhibit at the National Museum of Chernobyl in Kiev. So expect a new episode about that and in upcoming weeks we're also gonna have a long-awaited video about how actually works one-of-a-kind mechanical diorama located in that museum. Recently we met its developers and learned a lot of interesting details, which we'll happily share with you. And now to our hero. So, the device in the briefcase is called TIDU 3P, which is a acronym that likely stands for Testing Instrument of Disk Unit. So it allows to run diagnostics, write and read test data and normally was used for servicing those drives. Same as the disk drives, it was produced not in the Soviet Union, but in Bulgaria, at one of the Izot factories in Stara Zagora. In the case if you didn't know that, there was a certain specialization between socialistic bloc countries, and Bulgaria was focused on the production of everything related to data storage. So, this is the case. So, our idea was to check if it is possible to find any use for this probe, so for this we obviously needed a hard disk drive. Well, given that in current conditions to come to Skalai the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is somewhat hard, me and Mikhaeva went to the place that has the biggest collection of vintage mainframe and microcomputer equipment here in Ukraine. It is the State Polytechnical Museum based in Igor Sikorsky Kiev Polytechnical Institute. They have here a lot of computer stuff, such as early transistor computers or Soviet PDP-11 clones, or even such quite exotic devices as laser drives for Soviet mainframes. Well, frankly speaking, we even didn't know that those actually existed. But we were interested in the ES5061 hard disk drive, so as it comes from ES in its name, it was designed for ES OVM, Soviet IBM 360 clones. And they were a base foundation of nearly all computer data centers in the USSR in the 70s and in the 80s. But the word clone should not mislead you, because they cloned architecture, while the electronics was developed from scratch. Well, of course, it was not even close as good to original, but somewhat it worked. So, despite the drive from outside looks almost the same as the IBM one, they were not identical inside. One of the differences of these drives from any modern hard disks is that they use 15-inch removable disks in the form of a packet that consists of 12 plates on a shared axis. The capacity of one such packet was around 29 megabytes. Well, not much, but at that time it was not little as it seems. 
this is what the packet looks like. Well, this one in particular is Isot ES5053, which technically is the same, but it has somewhat fewer disks and hence lower capacity. By default, all of the speckers has a special plastic cover equipped with a handle, which all allows to conveniently carry them, but before all, that thing protects the disks from any accidental touch or dust which can damage their surface. And you cannot remove it just so, but only when it's installed inside a drive. So in the spindle there is a special lock which gets released only when you properly secure the packet on a drive's rotor. And then, when you remove the cover, working surfaces are no longer exposed. Well, this particular disk is damaged, so we don't need to take any precautions, and therefore I opened the lock using just a screwdriver. And this is what it looks like inside. Well, additionally, we have a brand new spare magnetic head, which is still in the original plastic box. Of course, inside the drive there are many more such heads that move back and forth using a step motor, and during operation the packet has a speed of 2400 rotations per minute, and heads would keep 300 microns distance from the disk surface. Despite its size, the disk drive itself doesn't have any data processing electronics, and normally to control its operation you need a special ES5568 controller, or if you do some diagnostics you can use our TDU probe for a low level control, so we will talk about this next. Since this very particular disk drive is a museum exhibit, we cannot break the seals inside, so we will try to show its internals as much as available space allows. So in the middle there is a crate of electronics, and to the left from it there is a huge power supply, which requires three phases of 380 volts AC. Behind, through a gap, it's possible to see a huge motor, which is around 30 kg heavy, and it has this powerful bell transmission to a disc rotor. Well, that looks really serious. And to the right from all this, there are numerous connectors, which are used for interface connections and also for diagnostics purposes. These connectors are of a type RG and RSHA, which are standard for ES mainframe systems. Our probe uses only a few connectors inside, but nevertheless I guess there are more than a hundred of wires coming. And honestly, for me it's a still a miracle how this insanely thick cable actually fits inside this relatively tiny briefcase. So while four of connectors matched perfectly by shape and inscriptions on them, it appeared that the probe has the fifth one, which doesn't match to anything. Well, our guess is that the fifth one is for the case when the probe is connected directly to the mainframe, because you could also use it this way to run the diagnostics when the machine was also up and running. Unfortunately, right at the moment neither us nor museum still don't have any documentation, and in reality the probe is that rare that it has a single mention in the internet at the Bulgarian website sandacitu.bg, which unfortunately doesn't work anymore. So what this device is able to do? Actually, pretty much. So the writable space of the hard drive is divided to so-called cylinders, which pass vertically through the all the magnetic disks and a share a spindle. With the probe we can test up to 202 cylinders and up to 20 heads. These operations are controlled using buttons, keys and potentiometers. So, there are a few status indicators that show that T2 probe is connected to the drive, or it is busy, or there is some malfunction. Then, there is this huge rotary switch, which allows you to choose the operation mode. Below there are connectors for the oscilloscope you would need to connect to monitor the interaction with the drive. Also, there is a smaller rotary switch, which controls the mode of data operations. So using it you can make the probe search the data between two addresses, or perform, say, sequential searches forward or backward. In those modes, the hard drive heads are sequentially positioned from the starting address 000 to 202 and back, and in the backward mode, vice versa. You can also try the random access, and the probe will set up random addresses from which the heads 
threads will read the data. The speed of all these operations is controlled by these small potentiometers, which set up cycles time from 10 to 200 milliseconds. You can read the data or write logical ones and logical zeros at specific addresses. So for this, the probe generates impulses of a frequency of 5 MHz for logical ones and 2.5 MHz for logical zeros. There is also this toggle switch called return to 000, which will return all the heads to the initial address. And above there are four buttons – address entry, head selection, diagnostics and single cycle. So with the diagnostics button, the probe will erase all errors at the hard drive. And after using these two first buttons, you would need to use those toggle switches to enter head and cylinder numbers in the corresponding registers. Of course, those are not all capabilities of this probe, but more will be able, unfortunately, to tell only when we find the documentation. All this electronics requires a separate external power supply, but surprisingly, it consumes very little, just around 10 watts. Well, when I tried to power it on, the only one thing I got was the power indicator glowing, so instead, let's try to look inside. It holds on four screws, and then you can lift all this panel with all internals at once out. Well, one thing I'm always generally fascinated about the mainframe epoch is how much empty space in that machinery you always find, and how heavy it is at the same time. This briefcase, for example, weighs 18 kilograms, but inside is, well, a lot of metal, and which is mounted actually quite low integrated electronics. But nevertheless, I have to say it's quite beautifully arranged. Hmm, those buttons are kind of really interesting. So here we have a little crate assembled with wire winding, and let's look inside it. So inside the crate are such small circuit boards with mostly TTL logic. They were marked, here are various generators, receivers and these kind of things. Well, I had a little chat with Skavai engineers uh, of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in regards of this, and they told me that while they quite actively used those disk drives, they didn't have any kinds of service equipment such as this probe, and instead they every time sent the malfunctioned parts to Kiev where they were serviced at the respective facility. So this actually pretty much crushed our hope to find any technical references in an easy way. Yeah? So if by the chance you have the commentation for the hard disk drive or for this TDU probe, I will gladly appreciate if you can share it with us. The language is not an issue because we understand written Bulgarian quite fluently. And for now we donated this uh, TDU probe to Polytechnic Museum, so if you appear in here, just come and see it. This all is a part of our larger work on Chernobyl mainframes, and despite we didn't have really much time recently to work on that, in the next weeks there will be a massive update about our Duga mainframe restoration, which will be on our Patreon page, and for now you can find previous updates there as well. So, I get ready for many interesting things coming, and that's it for today, see you next time! <laughs> Але збирати ці роз'єми це просто можна здохнути. Триста кілограмів. Добре, бачу, що там ці колеси кажуть, що воно можна так і вам. Це було.